My name is Boris Rashar. Um, I'm Managing Director at FTI Consulting. Uh, I'm honored to uh, host this panel uh, at the Horasis uh, Global Meeting, and I'm really thrilled uh, to uh, be able to ask questions uh, for, for esteemed uh, panelists uh, that represent a variety of businesses uh, in the crypto asset industry. So we're going to be tackling a pressing issue of digital asset compliance uh, and how we combat the financial crime uh, in the crypto space and what the industry and regulators are grappling with and what the uh, opportunities and challenges are. So just a disclaimer for everyone on this panel, whatever opinions uh, that we share and the panelists share in this uh, presentation do not necessarily represent the views uh, and the opinions of their, uh, of their employers. So uh, before we dive uh, into our session and the content, I wanted to ask the, uh, the panelists to introduce themselves and briefly talk about who they are and, and what their businesses do. So Dan, let me ask with you, please. Sure. Well, thank you, Boris, for having me here, and thank you to uh, to Horasis as well. Uh, I'm Dan Burstein. I am General Counsel and Chief Compliance Officer at Paxos. Uh, Paxos is a regulated financial institution um, that is uh, that has a tr charter from the New York State Department of Financial Services since 2015. Uh, we're focused on financial market infrastructure and modernizing financial market infrastructure. Uh, we, our mission is to enable the move, movement of any asset in any way, uh, at any time in a trustworthy way. And so we have a crypto exchange. Uh, we issue uh, two stable coins uh, backed by dollars as well as a gold backed token. Uh, we also have a security settlement product and solution. Thank you, uh, Ian, uh, if we continue with you, please. Sure. Thanks again, Boris and Horasis, for the opportunity to speak today. So I am Ian Rooney, Head of Enterprise Compliance at Coinbase. Uh, for those not familiar, Coinbase is the largest uh, exchange in the United States uh, handling crypto uh, assets. And, uh, you know, we, we part of our broader mission to um, build the crypto economy. Uh, more broadly, we, we do offer trading a number of different uh, crypto assets that are uh, available uh, across multiple uh, platforms today, as well as a U.S. dollar stable coin uh, that we issued in partnership with Circle um, to make uh, you know stable assets available on top of uh, the digital assets that you more commonly read about, like uh, Bitcoin and Ether. Awesome. Uh, Steve, uh, you're next, please. Yeah, sure. Um, my name is Steve Funnel. I'm the chief legal officer of the Diem Association, which is a, uh, a membership association. Actually, Coinbase is one of our members that is developing a, a global stablecoin uh, project. Um, it's it's going to be focused on the retail payments market. So we we like to think of ourselves as trying to um, sort of serve regular people trying to do regular things with uh, with blockchain technology. Uh, great, Antonio. Uh, thank you, Boris, for, for the opportunity, and uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, my name is Antonio Alvarez Lorenzo. I am the Chief Compliance Officer for Crypto.com. Uh, we are a global uh, crypto wallet provider. We also provide uh, prepaid cards, and an exchange, and a full service of uh, uh, crypto and, and fiat um, services around the world. Um, our mission is to empower our users uh, and to accelerate the world's uh, transition to cryptocurrency. So we're out there trying to bring uh, what I call cryptocurrency to uh, to um, Main Street. Thank you. And Tom? Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm Tom Robinson, the co-founder and chief scientist at Elliptic. Um, so we develop blockchain analysis tools that allow crypto businesses and financial institutions to assess risk on crypto transactions or wallets or businesses um, so that they can meet their anti-money laundering and sanctions compliance obligations. We also work closely with regulators and law enforcement agencies, providing them with the tools they need to track uh, illicit activity in crypto. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, so let's uh, dive in and into, uh, into a discussion. Uh, my first set of questions uh, really revolves around why is the urgency uh, related to the crypto compliance right now and the combating financial crime uh, in the digital asset space? Is it because there is more crime going on uh, right now or is it a reaction to the apparent crackdown that we are witnessing from regulatory and enforcement bodies across the globe in different countries? 
is it both or is it a systemic issue that sort of needs to be resolved for the uh, you know for, for the industry to move forward so uh, Tom on this one I would like to start with you and uh, you recently published an interesting report about sanctions and you have shown that you know sanction and blocked addresses have received quite a bit of money you know uh, over a certain period of time so uh, my question to you would be do you see a growing sophistication on the part of the bad actors to use digital assets in the space uh, or is it regulators just kind of going after the sector as a boat? What, what's your view on what's going on? Um, well, what I'd like to emphasize, first of all, is that criminals use any payment system that's available to them. This isn't an issue that's confined to, to cryptocurrencies. And in fact, our analysis shows that the level of illicit transactions in crypto is comparable or probably even lower than in dollars or pounds or euros. So to be precise, we see around 0.5% of Bitcoin transactions having some kind of link to illicit activity. And that proportion is still going down over time. Um, the fact is that by far the biggest use case of cryptocurrencies today is speculation, um, certainly not criminal activity. Um, but having said that, I think as an industry and community, we do need to accept that crypto has enabled some new types of cyber criminality um, because of its unique set of properties. You know, that it's digital, censorship resistant, has no inbuilt concept of identity. And so this, for example, has enabled ransomware to flourish. Um, the first recorded example of ransomware was back in the 1980s, but it really went nowhere because the payment of ransoms allowed the perpetrators to be identified. Um, cryptocurrency provides a method of paying ransoms that can't be blocked, um, which doesn't require an account at a financial institution um, linked to an identity. And so I think emerging risks such as ransomware are influencing regulation um, in crypto. But I don't think that tighter regulation or banning Bitcoin, as some have suggested, um, is at all the solution here. So yesterday, the, the FBI sees millions of dollars in ransom payments made to Darkside um, by leveraging the transparency of the blockchain to follow the money. Um, and I think that's how these risks will most effectively be addressed by exploiting the characteristics of cryptocurrency that actually make it a, a dream come true for law enforcement or compliance professionals. But, you know, that, that transparency of the blockchain. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ian, um, I, I turn your attention uh, um, to uh, sort of centralized crypto exchanges and uh, everybody who, you know, please share your views as well, chime in. So we have seen enforcement actions against two of the largest exchanges, right, in the world. BitMax late, late last year, and we have, we have also seen the news of uh, the Department of Justice probe against Binance. Uh, we know that there is a crackdown in China that has been going on over the past few weeks, and some of the global exchanges pared down their offerings, you know, when, when it comes to the crypto derivatives. Do you see this as a beginning of some kind of a large enforcement trend uh, or regulatory uh, trend against the large uh, centralized uh, crypto exchanges? Yeah, it's an interesting, interesting question, Boris. I, I think that it's not so much a trend against centralized exchanges per se, but more about the awareness and familiarity that um, the regulators have with the crypto industry and just becoming more um, uh, active and playing a bit of catch up, I think, in terms of developments, right? The, the, the pace of innovation and change in the crypto economy, I think, is, is much faster than in traditional finance. And so I think what we're seeing uh, here now is a bit of active catch up on uh, the part of uh, the, our law enforcement partners and our regulators. Um, I expect to see some tension playing out over time across different sets of the, of the cryptosphere um, based on the broader political objectives of the different uh, governments, maybe uh, regionally. So I think that we could see where there's a more of a focus on open markets. I think that the regulatory uh, you know, focus, um, not so much on centralized exchanges, but just on things like investor protection, uh, ensuring that we're, we still allow for adoption and innovation, where you have um, more centrally managed economies, I think that's where we may start to see um, a more of a tightening of a position uh, in terms of uh, interference, where, where there's maybe perception of interference with, with larger national government uh, objectives. So, candidly, I, I think it's not clear how effective a ban would be outright on, on crypto, um, but uh, just given the prevalence of the crypto players and the increasing use of decentralized finance, but I definitely think you'll start to see a divergence of views emerge among different uh, types of uh, regulated economies. Okay, thank you. Uh, turning to stable coins. Um, so, and that's a question to you, Steve. Um, uh, the Financial Action Task Force, the global watchdog, you know, stable coins, they have been on their radar screen for quite some time right now. 
Uh, we know that the president's working group on financial markets also made certain statements about, uh, you know, the regulation and compliance issues in, in stable coins. And the stable coins is definitely a growing instrument. Um, and what's interesting is that the peer-to-peer -peer transactions uh, in a stable coin world increase in both in terms of the transaction count and in terms of just the dollar value. So with all this said, uh, where do you see the regulatory and compliance landscape developing in the stable coin world? Well, I think there's, as Ian said, there's a lot, there's a lot of education um, at the regulator and policymaker level that still needs to occur. I mean, there, there's been a lot in recent, certainly in the last couple of years. Um, but, uh, you know, as we're seeing with a turnover of, of administration in the U.S., you've got new leadership coming in. And they need to sort of regroup and reassess. And, and so um, I'm not sure how fast things will actually move. Uh, I think uh, there, there's been a, a kind of a, a lengthy uh, global uh, sort of think tank seminar on stable coins that's been going on now for some time. And I think it will continue for some time before we get, uh, hopefully we'll get some maybe some clearer and uh, more tailored rules uh, in the future. Um, I, personally, I'm I, I'm optimistic that there's a balance that can be struck. Uh, I mean, one of the one of the real concerns, and it's highlighted by the the recent ransomware attacks, is you know the anonymity that is is both a, a virtue and a risk of of crypto. Um, you know, is front and center on the regulators' uh, minds. And so we need to find a way. Um, I mean, I, I, I think of it from a from the from the perspective of our project, we're, we're trying to get financial exclusion right so that we can then pivot to financial inclusion. And I think that's the sequence. You need to satisfy people that you're not building uh, something that is going to be a threat to law enforcement or national security interests. Uh, I don't think that's all that hard to do, but I think there's work to be done there. And then once you've, and then once you've established that foundation, I think there's great potential uh, to, to use the technology to reach people who are, who are currently not uh, able to take advantage of financial uh, systems. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, uh, Antonio, um, uh, turning uh, attention to the payment, uh, payment platform, crypto.com, um, is um, Antonio? Did uh, did we lose you? Oh, he just appeared, and then uh, his image disappeared. Um, for for us, one, one thing I just add. Uh, hopefully, yeah, yeah, while, right. while Antonio returns uh, to, to yeah. what, what Steve said, is that uh, yeah? I mean, I think that as a, as a, a stablecoin issuer ourselves at Paxos. Um, I think one thing that we're seeing is really a lot of constructive engagement by regulators, uh, U.S. and internationally, on stablecoin regulation and oversight. Um, there was a financial stability uh, board report last year um, that was that was extremely thoughtful um, about uh, you know about what are the what are the principles of stablecoin regulation? What are the uh, the ways to ensure that uh, stable coins don't pose a safety and soundness or a broader financial stability risk to the financial system. Um, it laid out some, uh, uh, you know, some some clear guidelines for regulators to follow. Um, and this this is a report that was really issued to the G20. Um, and so therefore, you know, guidance to various, uh, various countries um, about what are we going to, you know, what are the best practices about having uh, a primary regulator overseeing uh, stablecoin, uh, but having sort of uh, clear and reliable governance structures uh, about clear oversight of the reserves and, uh, and and strong management of the reserves underlying the stablecoins, mm -hmm. all with the idea in mind that the at the end of the day, there's going to be those dollars. Those dollars are going to be there um, uh, when a consumer wants them back. Okay, understood. Thank you so much. Um, turning to the other two uh, sector that I really wanted to briefly touch on, uh, Antonio, uh, as a big payment platform, um, you know, crypto.com, crypto uh, there, uh, there was an Office of uh, Foreign Asset Control action against uh, uh, the BitPay uh, right in February this year. So there were some alleged violations of, um, you know, sanctions controls. Does that put you on a heightened alert going forward or is it just a kind of one-off uh, occurrences? Um, the, it's funny. I think OFAC is always uh, top of mind for um, all compliance officers all the time, right? Um, OFAC carries a, a very big stick. 
Um, and, and in this case, I think BitPay had a, a half a million dollar fine. Um, you, you can recall uh, PayPal a couple of years ago, about 2015, I think it was, we got, they got a $7 million fine. In 2013, BNP got a 900 and, and 60 some million dollar fine. So, um, crypto and it's not different than any, than any other financial institution when it comes right. to sanctions. Uh, we should all be very afraid of OFAC. They mean it. Uh, and, uh, and they, they, they make sure that you understand and everybody knows that they mean, uh, when, when they sanction somebody not to, not to do any business with them. Um, having said that, it's a little, um, crypto is a little different. Um, and, and you have, we have to be a little more sensitive, um, in this respect than, than the usual financial services. Um, cause usually when we interact with that, with a, an account on the blockchain that we're not familiar with, um, even we use tools like, you know, like Elliptic, for example, um, as a brand new address, there's very little information on it. It's only until there's more information, there's, you know, the, 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 the forensic tools are able to tag it and cluster it that we find out really the nature of that account is. Um, so we may find out, we may find, um, you know, weeks later or even months later that a transaction that we did was connected to somebody that had some level of connection with a sanctioned individual organization or country. So if you, when, if, when a bank does a transaction, they screen it and they're done, right? Because no new information is going to come later. For us, we need, it's something that is a lot more on top of mind every day and for all historical transactions. So it's, it's a, it's a lot more risky, uh, and more sensitive for us. Okay. Thank you. Um, Dan, and uh, uh, back back to you on on the issue of uh, digital custodians, because right, Paxos is one of the your premier digital custodians, qualified ones. And again, there was some enforcement action against, against Bitgo, uh, and not that that uh, you know, not that long ago. Uh, albeit they did not necessarily, um, OFAC did not necessarily go after Bitgo on their particular custodian business, right? It was related to a host, you know, hot wallet service. But nevertheless, does that also kind of create concern in your mind going forward as to what uh, the crypto custodians will face from the regulators and enforcers uh, in the future? Yeah, well, well the, 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 my answer will be short here because Antonio said a lot of what I was going to say, was, <laughs> and, 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 I, and I'm going to say me too. I really uh, I completely agree with everything that he said about uh, the sort of broader applicability of sanctions compliance uh, and the fact that uh, you know everyone has to be very conscious and cautious of uh, of sanctions. And, you know, I think that's what we're seeing in these enforcement actions, whether it's in the custody space, uh, other elsewhere in the digital asset space, or more broadly, is that um, you need to be aware of it. You need to uh, have your systems uh, and, and sanctions controls in place. Uh, for Paxos, as a regular... Am I still on? Yes. Uh, regulated by the New York Department of Financial Services, what we see, uh, what we have is uh, a, a regulation called Part 504, uh, which is where the New York Department of Financial Services is making sure that um, its regulated entities, including Paxos and including all of those in the crypto space, um, have appropriate uh, f sanctions filters, sanctions, sanctions controls, it applies to transaction monitoring as well, that are appropriately attuned to, to our risk profile and our risk assessment. And, um, you know, the, and, and so therefore, it's, you know, it's our regulators, obviously it's the concern about OFAC, obviously it's, it's just the, the right thing to do is to have your uh, sanction screening at onboarding uh, make sure that uh, anyone within your walled garden and anyone you're transacting with and anyone for whom you're custodying funds, whether it's crypto or otherwise, um, is, uh, has passed sanctions controls, uh, has passed sanctions screening, and is subject to your ongoing sanctions screening at all times. Mm -hmm. um, and also that, uh, that and, and this is something from the, uh, the enforcement action that you mentioned, um, that, that you're taking advantage and, and, and uh, reviewing and monitoring all the information that you have available to you on an ongoing basis, uh, including, in that case, uh, IP controls uh, and IP addresses. If you are doing uh, IP monitoring, which you should be doing, and uh, you, know, you, should be know, you should know, therefore, uh, at least in the first instance, uh, you know, setting aside use of VPNs, where your, where, where your customers are coming from and where they're accessing your platform from, um, you need to, uh, to to factor that into your uh, your platform and your controls, and uh, and not allow the activity to be coming in from comprehensively sanctioned jurisdictions. Understood. 
Well, thank you so much. Um, so let me jump uh, to the to the next hot topic um, that I, I really wanted to, uh, to ask your opinion about. If you read the recent uh, um, report by the Financial Stability Institute, associate you know with with the Bank of International Settlements, so they put out a report, uh, I believe, either in, in April or May, and they, they were trying to document uh, the state of affairs when it comes to the crypto and digital asset compliance and regulation. And the takeaway from the report was that there is a lot of work going on in different jurisdictions, but there is quite a bit of stuff to still harmonize in terms of how the assets are treated, you know, how which entities may be subject to reporting rules, uh, what to do with the self-hosted wallets. And even when it comes to the travel rule, which governs how the information has to be shared between the regulated entities, something in cryptos which would be similar in, in spirit, um, to um, to the traditional financial asset, even with respect to the travel rule, there is no uh, consensus of what the reporting threshold should be. Right, the, the U.S. trade defense end was trying to push two hundred fifty dollars last December. In the U.S., it's three thousand right now. One thousand U. One thousand euros in Europe. So there is quite a bit of lack of harmonization when it comes to compliance. So my next set of questions is to how the regulators and industry should be thinking about how to harmonize and sort of make the relation consistent. So uh, Steve, I would like to start this uh, segment with you and kind of turn again to stable coins. Um, the, the treatment seems to be different, right? The regulatory treatment. Uh, uh, if you could elaborate on that and where do you see sort of the path forward? Because if stable coins are going to be a wo- worldwide global payment tool, what do you have to, to do to sort of harmonize their treatment across the globe? Well, there is a lot of variety, and it's not just in terms of the rules that are on the books, but it's the degree of you know, oversight and the resources that are devoted to examination. Um, so th- there, there's there's quite a range, even within FATF countries, obviously. Um, I, I mean, the way we've reacted to that reality, and I suspect the way others do, is that you... You try to pick, I don't know if it's the lowest common denominator or the highest common denominator. I guess it's the highest standard. Um, and, uh, you, you know, so we we basically are applying U.S. standard BSA, AML uh, compliance globally. Um, and we, we do that in part because, you know, that's the brand that we want to have. We want to be, con- but it's also as an administrative matter. Um, it's almost impossible to to run a company with uh, you know twenty five different uh, yeah. compliance standards. So you, you're kind of driven to that, um, uh, and I think it will take time. It will take time. So. Okay. Well, I guess then uh, you know t- turning turning to you. So you have a variety of businesses under the umbrella of Paxos, right? You have an exchange, you have a custodian, and you have a, you you're an issuer of stablecoin. You have a provisional approval to become a national bank in, in the in the U.S. So having this varied business structure does make kind of your life particularly difficult because if you have inconsistencies in compliance regulation and enforcement in different jurisdictions and you have a variety of businesses to to take care of, does that make your life even more difficult? Well, but, but my job is never boring. I'll tell you that much. It's okay. uh, it's, uh, it's it's always interesting. Always keeps us on our toes. And uh, uh, you know, put in a quick plug. Uh, come work for us. Uh, so you, you know, it won't be boring for you either. Paxos dot com slash careers. Apologies for the quick plug. Um, but yeah, what's what's really the underlying theme of all of our different uh, products and services is financial market infrastructure. Um, we, we, we are replatforming the financial system uh, using blockchain technology uh, because the rails on which financial uh, uh, transactions occur and have occurred for, for decades um, is massively updated and needs to be, uh, needs to be upgraded and modernized. And so, um, you know, the, the important thing for, for Paxos is that we were founded on the principle of regulation first, of asking for permission rather than forgiveness. And we do that not just because it's the right thing to do, which of course it is, uh, but because we think that this is good for business. This is the right business opportunity for us. Um, we want to be the infrastructure provider to uh, some of the world's biggest companies. Um, PayPal is one of them where uh, uh, we, we are uh, the, the sort of back end support 
for PayPal's crypto offering. And, um, you know, companies like those, and I think you'll see more of those in the pipeline as, uh, as, as the year progresses, um, uh, uh, you know, they want to engage with a reliable, regulated f- uh, financial institution. Um, they want to know that uh, that they're engaging with us is not uh, is not going to get them in any trouble, and is rather going to um, to, to keep them in front of the uh, financial uh, uh, regulators um, in a good way. And so, what that means for us is, um, you know, I mean, our compliance controls have to be top notch. They have to meet our regulatory standards. Currently, you mentioned the OCC preliminary conditional approval that we received. We have to we have to meet. Um, you know, all of those requirements, as well as the top uh, uh, audit and SOC certification requirements um, to, uh, uh, to, to be able to convey that kind of trustworthiness to our customers. And so what that means from a compliance perspective is our compliance team needs to be really good and really smart, and they are. Um, we need to, uh, to know our products and to assess our risk uh, accurately and be truthful and candid with ourselves and our regulators. Um, we need to know how our products are being used both on our platform and off of our platform. Um, and these are the kinds of things that will mitigate our risk and allow us to, uh, to, to continue to serve our, uh, our customers and, um, and maintain our regulatory status in a positive and constructive way. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, Antonio, um, you, you know, you have already been experienced uh, working with different um, technological platforms to uh, so to establish compliance, right, with respect to digital assets. So you partner with Chainalysis uh, in, in some parts of the world. So you're operating global business at the moment. Um, you you know now have experience running with the CypherTrace Traveler solution for enforcing and uh, uh, implementing the travel rule for digital assets. So given your experience, what are the particular inconsistencies and regulations and requirements that make your life harder than it should be? Uh, You're on mute. Ah, I did it. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) The the always uh, funny mute button. No, it's it's funny because I was thinking about um, how hard used to the world be when, uh, when our biggest worry was to um, comply with 50 different uh, MTL regulators around the U.S. Uh, and now the travel rule comes around and you have hundreds and everybody's taking a different uh, a different flavor. Everybody's calling us different. So in places we are virtual asset providers and other ones we're crypto asset providers or uh, we're digital uh, currencies. It's, it's, it's all over the place. And, and the hardest thing that we find with the travel rule is that you cannot communicate the information with somebody that doesn't want to receive it. Um, so in order to comply with the travel rule, you're depending on your counterparty. So our approach so far has been to try and accommodate as many counterparties as possible by integrating with a variety of tools that will allow us to communicate with counterparties. Um, talk about, you know, FADA looks of our global consistency and travel rule is where you need it the most. Um, you know, FIU cooperation and sanction standards and all that is great. But in the travel rule, in order to apply it right, you really need everybody to be talking the same language in the same format on the same standards. Otherwise, you are you're speaking different languages and will never be able to communicate clearly enough to really prevent the financial crimes that the travel rule is trying to address. Um, so that's why our, our approach has been so far to try and adapt to as many as possible. So we can have a, a coherent network and, and speak as many languages as possible, if you wish, so we can communicate with as many as our counterparties as we can. But it's definitely, it's definitely if, for me, it's the number one priority in, in, in making the, the rules more consistent around the world. It should be around the travel rule. It, it's what's going to unite this or, or break the entry. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, and Tom, uh, Elliptic uh, is well known for its uh, blockchain analytics and tracing tools, right? So you can disentangle very complex uh, flows of crypto funds between different uh, different wallets and clusters of, of addresses. So turning to this question of sort of different regulations, of different thresholds, of different uh, vectors of attack in, in different uh, jurisdictions, how do your clients use or, 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 or adapt your tools? Or how do you help them adapt your tools in, in really being, being able to weed out the bad actors where bad actors may be defined differently in different parts of the world? Yes, exactly. So we, we do have 
clients all over the world. And one of the core product principles we have is that risk is subjective. And also our various clients might have slightly different legal obligations. And so when um, risk is assessed in our software on a wallet or a business or a transaction, what we're actually doing behind the scenes is tracing the funds through the blockchain, looking at source of funds, looking at destination of funds and giving that information to our customers. We don't say that this transaction has come from a bad entity or this transaction has come from a good entity. We just tell you exactly where it's come from or where it's going to. Now you can, on top of that, add um, information about your own risk appetite through our customizable risk rules. So you can say that I consider gambling services to high risk or I consider exchanges in this jurisdiction to be high risk. Um, but that's something that you customize yourself rather than being imposed by us. And I think that's a really important core principle mm -hmm. for us. Okay. Thank you. And Ian, um, uh, so a Coinbase, uh, well known uh, in the digital asset space, uh, you went through uh, the direct listing. So you have become a publicly a traded company. Uh, congratulations on that. Uh, the question is being a public company, right? Probably facing a different set of reporting and all kinds of audit requirements. So how does change your, you know, business of, uh, you know, maintaining compliance, especially when those compliance regulations are maybe different and, and your operating is, you know, more than 100 countries. So, you know, that's probably on top of mind. Yeah, look, I think at the end of the day, being a public company doesn't fundamentally change our compliance responsibilities as an organization, right? We, like Dan said, you know, uh, think about trying to be the most trusted name in crypto, want to make sure doing things in a way that aligns to uh, the regulations that apply to our businesses, no matter where we operate. And so, you know, while we, we, we strive to do that at, at you know, state, federal, international level, we recognize that the, the rules were written in a time that wasn't, uh, it was pre-crypto. It was not designed to, to uh, cover our businesses as they operate today. So I think the biggest change for us since becoming a public company, uh, to your comment, is just really about, uh, about being more in the spotlight, right? So we, we're conscious that our actions, our decisions, and how we approach uh, tackling some of the issues that are pressing on our industry uh, may be amplified more so than they were before our direct public offering uh, back in April. So I think, you know, we just want to be conscious as a as a company that our choices and, and how we uh, comport ourselves will have potential ripple effects on the broader crypto industry. So I think that, that we keep that top of mind as we go about um, deciding the best way to be compliant with the ever-shifting kind of regulatory landscape that we're acting within. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, uh, I wanted now to turn to another uh, interesting um, area that uh, deserves you know, quite a bit of discussion, in particular, the decentralized finance world, right? So uh, the decentralized finance, which is effectively a smart contract driven universe of lending and borrowing protocols, automated market makers, asset management platforms, uh, and liquidity pools. So, uh, you know, it came and, and took the crypto as a war by the storm in 2020. Uh, and now the question is, uh, if you deal with a bunch of self-hosted wallets, which is that's what how people transact on the DeFi, uh, in the DeFi space, what do you do? How do you ensure that the DeFi decentralized finance should be brought under the umbrella of compliance? Or should they be at all brought under this umbrella of compliance? So that's one question. And the second question that I wanted to ask for your opinion, guys, is to non-fungible tokens. So the tokens that are unique, that may be thought of, about, of as, uh, as um, you know, digital representation of certain collectibles, right? And, you know, the, again, there has been explosion in non-fungible token issue on this year. And the question is, do you see any uh, dangers in how, whether the NFTs should also be uh, brought under the, the compliance umbrella? So with this set of mind, I just wanted to start with you, Ian. Uh, and I know that uh, Coinbase, uh, you know, is very supportive of the DeFi world. So you joined the Decentralized Finance Alliance uh, a few months ago, and uh, you're trying to support and guide, you know, the startups in the DeFi space. So where do you see the evolution of the DeFi uh, going forward? What should be done about them being part of the fight against the illicit finance in, in a digital asset space? Yeah, it's a, that's a great question, and it's a hard question, right? I think we're all wrestling with it um, as an industry. But I think, you know, obviously we, we recognize decentralized finance as a logical evolution of the crypto 
uh, sphere given it, the underlying drivers for crypto creation in the first place. And so, you know, I think compliance uh, applications will require a mindset shift on the part of both uh, industry and the regulator as to how we, we tackle these challenges. So I, I expect near term that there will be uh, the compliance obligations and the focus will sit with the on ramps and the off ramps to traditional uh, fiat world, right? So I think regulators will look to centralized exchanges like Coinbase to provide, to essentially manage the compliance risk associated with the decentralized finance world. And that may put more pressure on us and others um, and banks, right? Uh, to, to vet these DeFi applications or protocols as part of our uh, due diligence uh, obligations and how we think about monitoring uh, interactions with those uh, protocols on on uh, different different blockchains that exist in the in the broader uh, crypto sphere. But I think longer term, I think that I suspect DeFi protocols um, that will will thrive are the ones that that kind of build compliance directly into their infrastructure, right? So they're not um, built in a way, or they're built in a way that thinks about um, the, the regulatory interest in mind and balancing those regulatory and privacy considerations side by side. Uh, and then maybe, for example, you mentioned smart contracts. There may be ways where um, there could be trusted service providers that are uh, that are, are uh, checked uh, independent of or sit alongside of the blockchains that uh, confirm that uh, the activities you're you're engaging in or the persons you're conducting with have somehow been val- verified or validated in the jurisdictions and where you're operating. So that would allow some flexibility for, for KYC compliance, depending on where you where you want to uh, mm-hmm. operate or where you want to conduct business while uh, also doing so in a way that's compliant with the local regulations. I think that's where we're going to see a slow evolution in thinking uh, happening in, in the DeFi space. I understood. Quite, quite interesting. Uh, Tom, um, you uh, uh, the Financial Action Task Force going to rock the world a little bit earlier this year because they said, you know, the, the teams of developers and those who operate smart contracts or that who put them together have to be, you know, considered to be virtual asset service providers. So we make the entire DeFi world part of the travel rule requirements and the compliance reporting requirements, right? You presented your views, and some some folks say, well, you know, that should not be the case because it's uh, the fiat on ramps and on rails are, are are controlled by the crypto exchanges. So as long as centralized services do their work, then DeFi should not necessarily be responsible for you know any additional due diligence on their customers because they have already been due diligence by the crypto exchanges. I know that you presented your views to the Financial Asset Task Force. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, th- I think this is a, a fascinating issue as well as a challenging one. I mean, with DeFi now, what we have is the possibility that financial services can largely be software. You know, it doesn't need to be a, an office of people. It can literally just be code. So decentralized exchanges like Uniswap are just code running on Ethereum. Mm-hmm. And so we think that 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 innovation really requires a fundamental rethink of how the goals of anti-money laundering are achieved. Um, so at the moment, it's largely based around the idea that financial services are provided by identifiable businesses, which can be subject to regulation. Um, you can make sure that those businesses are compliant. You can request records from them. You can shut them down if necessary. But of course, you can't do that if the financial service is just code running on a blockchain. And I'm not saying that AML can't be achieved, but I, I, I think that the approach needs to shift for DeFi. Um, and again, I think that any new regulation needs to really take account of the fact that DeFi operates on completely transparent blockchains. Um, a, de- a, a decentralized exchange is not a black box like a traditional financial institution. You have complete visibility of what asset is being exchanged for another asset, for example, on a DEX. Um, so law enforcement can trace funds through these services without having to request records from them, for example. I think that's a, a really powerful concept and any new regulation here should take account of it rather than trying to just apply the same old rules when this is really a new a new paradigm in finance. I see. Well, the, the, the question is, what if, uh, what if um, just like on Ethereum, people start using the tumblers and mixing services like Tornado Cash, right? How would you deal with that? I mean, the stuff is transparent, but it becomes less transparent because some of the sources and tracings of fund become more convoluted. Yes, I think that's a bit different um, because, yes, you're losing that visibility. Um, I think you have to look at um, whether people are 
running those services as a business though is somebody getting transaction fees from it in which case they're clearly a regulated entity that should be uh, complying mm-hmm. with aml rules i understood uh antonio um so the crypto.com launched the nft marketplace earlier this year and uh, some some believe that you know the NFT, nft is the non-fungible tokens may be used for money laundering because if you think about them as digital art, digital art uh, is being used sometimes for those purposes. So the question is, now that you operate this uh, you know, NFT marketplace, do you believe that at some point the regulators may say, well, it is a virtual asset service provider, so it might be compliant? What, what, would, what, what would you think? Well, I, we, there's two components to that. Or there, there's two, two factors that, that need to be analyzed. One is um, when, when thinking about the, the involvement of regulations or the, the requirements to comply with AML. One is the nature of the NFT, right? An NFT could be a tokenized real estate title, right? And by itself, it's an asset and it would never be a financial instrument, as you wish, or, or a concert ticket. Or now it could be. You know, like we're seeing, um, it could be a, a, a fraction of, uh, of an art piece, yeah. in which case it may, st- it may start getting into the financial services, um, arena or in the securities area. Um, you know, you could do, uh, you could do NFTs as traveler's checks, right? Or money orders, um, which are, you know, non fungible financial, um, assets. So the, there, there is a possibility that the asset itself could become a, a financial uh, financial service, in which case it should be it should be regulated. But the other aspect that I think is even more important is about the role that the company that is providing this marketplace is is, is doing. Um, so the the role that the, the 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 marketplace plays should define if they are itself a money transmitter or a money service business or not. Um, so if you think about it, um, Amazon, Airbnb, they are e-commerce platforms. They're also money service businesses. They're also money transmitters because they are, they're funneling, they're collecting funds from a buyer to pay to a seller. Their money, is, their, their business is to money, to move the money around. They may fall into exceptions here and there, but the basic concept is they are in, in they're a financial institution and, and as such, they are subject to AML and, and uh, financial crime prevention. So I think it's important that as we continue to evolve in the NFT em- environment, that we keep an eye on both the assets and the type of NFTs that are being issued and traded, as well as the roles that the specific platforms are playing, because some of them are playing and only doing it with uh, decentralized wallets, for example. And, and they, they take uh, that platform takes a different role than a platform like ourselves, where we actually embrace it and say, we are going to be you know, processing the transactions um, and we're going to be applying AML and, and uh, regulations um, to, to our platform. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dan, um, uh, Paxos has um, recently engaged with the uh, sort of um, off-chain Oracle company, Link, right? Because you uh, you started, uh, well, uh, the global, the stablecoin Pax, Pax standard is now accepted and as a collateral, crypto collateral of some of the uh, crypto lenders. Um, and I scanned through, and I looked at those, you know, like BlockFi was one of them. You know, it was based on what I can see on the internet, right? And the G5 Pulse and, and the Celsius network. How do you go about choosing, you know, which G5 platform to partner with in terms of their compliance risk? Yeah, the, the, it, and it's, it's been exceptional uptake in the uh, in the yeah. use of our, our uh, Paxos issued tokens. Uh, it's not you mentioned Paxos standard. We also have uh, another dollar backed oh. stablecoin called BUSD. Uh, Bin- which is the Binance dollar, white labeled for for Binance, and uh, Pax Gold, which is uh, uh, backed by gold. To all, all together, those uh, 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 those have a market cap of uh, over ten billion dollars. So we're seeing tremendous uptake uh, of of Paxos back tokens or Paxos issued tokens. Uh, at the same time as we're seeing tremendous uptake in the DeFi space, um, DeFi over uh, the Wall Street Journal reported last week. DeFi has gone from a billion dollars, one billion dollars to over a hundred billion dollars just over the past year um, right. in total value locked, and that's that's tremendous growth. Skills um, and you know what what we see from Paxos's perspective is um, we need to keep monitoring the space. You know we obviously with respect to partnerships, uh, we vet our partners well. We we, we only will partner with um, the most. Uh, 
uh, uh, the, the most uh, well respected and uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, well regarded um, companies that are out there in the DeFi space, but also you know to Tom's point and to Ian's point, um, you know, DeFi is not just one thing, and uh, we all sort of feel this tension. None of us have perfect answers with respect to DeFi. Uh, I certainly don't. Um, um, and, uh, you know, there, there are certain, uh, participants in the DeFi space that are, uh, worse actors than others. Um, most DeFi is really to, uh, intended to, um, you know, t- to make financial, uh, infrastructure easier, smoother, more efficient, um, to service the unbanked and to increase financial inclusion. And, you know, these are all terrific values that we should all be encouraging, but we have to w- watch out for the, uh, the sort of regulatory signals in the space, we have to watch out for uh, the risks that are ongoing. Um, thank you. Um, um, uh, turning back to stable coins. So uh, a, DM, a DM payment network is supposed, uh, uh, is supposed to be a global uh, enabler of financial inclusion globally, right? And what's interesting uh, about the DM, at least as far as I know, um, uh, you guys try to put some AML and KYC uh, capabilities at a level of a programming language that's being used to power the virtual machine on the DM network, right? So Steve, the question to you, do you see this as one of the potential ways for the DeFi? Uh, you know, to uh, to heed the compliance regulations, so basically, kind of deploy a smart contract that would be enabled natively at a layer one level to uh, to screen to block transactions if necessary, and kind of that sort of thing. What what's your take on that? You're on mute. Let me let me start by saying um, that you know we are not presently operational. So what you describe is um, uh, you know. A, an aspiration and a plan, um, but it's not something that we've actually, you know, executed on. So I, I think our our practical experience is obviously somewhat limited. Um, I, and I'm not a computer scientist, but I understand that the move language, which underlies our blockchain, um, does have advantages in, in terms of its modular structure that will facilitate um, sort of building innovative uh you know, smart contract applications on top of it in a way that is easier for us to get comfortable with uh, in Mm -hmm. terms of its its safety. And um, I I think that as a general matter, um, you know, reg tech in various forms um, will facilitate some of these things. You know, I think, I mean, ultimately the challenge uh, with a lot of these applications, whether it's NFTs or or DeFi or generally um, is is just getting the KYC piece of this right. And I think there are ways to improve digital identity and making the documentation that is, is necessary for, uh, say, somebody to get an account on uh, Coinbase to make that easier. And 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 that will that will simultaneously improve access and I think get regulators comfortable. And so I think there's a lot there's a lot that can be done on our platform and on others uh, to kind of get those what I like to call security privacy win wins. Uh, I think there are a lot of them out there, and that's really what this technology is all about. Um, just taking it up to a higher level. Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, I guess I just uh, really wanted to uh, kind of ask for your opinion, uh, opinion, guys. What to uh, what to expect going going forward, right? Because we have seen a lot of talk, a lot of focus, um, you know, from all over the place. Uh, you know, there has been you know comments from Janet Yellen from the U.S. Treasury. Um, so SEC Chairman Gensler, you know, spoke in the Congress asking for more regulation for crypto exchanges in, in investor protection. So, uh, you know, up to the point that the Biden is going to talk about a, a different aspect of compliance ransomware, right, at the G7 upcoming summit. So there is definitely a lot of attention to this uh, area of uh, financial crime and, and compliance in the digital asset space. So just wanted to kind of for you to hear your kind of concluding remarks. And let me, uh, you know, start with you, Antonio, um, given that you operate in different you know, markets and we've seen, you know, additional restriction and tightenings up in South Korea and Singapore. 
what's your chief overall take on how it's going to all evolve? Yeah, it's interesting how different uh, regulators are focusing on different things. Uh, while I, th I believe all of them should be focused on all three major areas of relations for crypto, financial crimes, definitely investor protection and security and cyber and cyber and data privacy. I think those are the three areas that are, that are consistently um, sporadic around uh, the different regulators, but that they need to be embraced by all of them. I mean, from uh, from the, the reactions of the new South Korean law, so focused on security versus uh, we're seeing the, the Ontario and the Canadian regulators now focusing a lot more on investment protections and it's all over the world. My hope, um, to wrap it up, my hope is to, from my end, my hope is that the, as they're starting to evolve deeper into all three areas, that they understand that crypto is a very wide concept and that they will need to get a lot more granular and, and start regulating the coins for what they are um, individually, not necessarily as crypto, right? We don't we don't regulate um, automobiles um, or, or vehicles as as a class. We do regulate trucks different than motorcycles. Um, and that, that way, a stable coin or a utility coin or a speculative coin should be regulated differently. And as as regulators pro, you know, progress in each one of these three areas, and we look at you know that the stable coin should be more focused on safeguarding versus a, a speculative coin should be more focused on investor protection, etc. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm hoping the regulator will continue to evolve and hopefully unify and, and provide us with a consistent uh, framework across all three areas. Understood. Thank you. Uh, uh, the, you know, uh, Dan and Ian, because you are you know operating well-regulated and well-established centralized crypto exchange services, right? What what are your views on all this uh, talk? You know, by the SEC that there must be more regulation. You know, you guys have to be regulated as sort of regular, you know, equities or stock stock exchanges. And what's your take on this? And how do you think? the investor protection rules may evolve in the digital asset space. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll follow Antonio's lead here a little bit and say that you know, digital assets are not just one thing. Uh, they, uh, they, are, they are assets, just, and there are a variety of them and different types. Um, and they take on their underlying characteristics. So there are securities, digital assets, there are commodities, digital assets, um, and there are uh, digital assets that are, that are neither um, and have different, uh, different characteristics as well. Uh, and so, therefore, different rules apply to different assets. Different regulators are going to apply to, uh, apply different rules. Um, and the uh, it, it, you mentioned Boris, the SEC, um, and uh, investor protection. Um, we think that regardless of whether uh, a, a a token or a digital asset is regulated by the SEC um, or by another regulator, um, it should really a common set of rules should apply. And, um, you know, we looked at some of the underlying securities laws and some of the underlying investor protection laws for this. Um, some of the, uh, the, the sort of old favorites like robust disclosure and inherent fairness and an avoidance of conflicts of interest. Um, Paxos is a founding member of the Association for Digital Asset Markets, uh, or ADAM, which is uh, a, a collection of companies that are really responsible players in this space. And... Uh, want to convey to the market that there are differences between responsible players and irresponsible players. We've established for ourselves a code of conduct um, that, that mirror a lot of the best practices in other industries, including the FX markets and in securities markets. Um, and, uh, you know, re really we welcome the conversation to, uh, to, to sort of set these minimum standards to establish uh, whether it's, it's broader uh, SEC or government oversight over uh, digital asset exchanges, whether it's uh, self-governance and, and, and uh, self-regulatory organization or what have you, um, th th there's a lot more to come in this space to uh, really set the level playing field and help investors know where are the responsible places to put their money. Got it. Okay. I, th I think, uh, you know, Dan, Dan stole most of my thunder <coughs> there, but um, uh, Sorry about I, that. I wholeheartedly agree with, with the way you... No, no, no. I agree, wholeheartedly agree with the way you summarized the, the space. I think I just... Just add a couple of thoughts there. One is, uh, I think you touched on, uh, you know, kind of different, you and, and, uh, Antonio you touched on different, uh, regulations for different types of, of assets. And I think that is certainly something we need to start seeing here. We will start seeing here. And I think it, going back to the point Antonio made earlier about having consistent terminology, right, across the different regulators, uh, to describe the type of assets we're dealing with would be a, a good first step forward so that we all agree we're talking about the same types of, of transactions or behaviors or assets. And therefore, you can you can approach it in the common sense way uh, to regulate them 
in a consistent fashion across different uh, uh, global actors. The other thing I'll just add, you know, to, uh, to the point I think that Dan made around, uh, you know, the Atom organization is, you know, we also start, we, we may also start to see a move towards self-regulatory organizations uh, in this space and, and, and seeing a little more um, of a focus on, on a FINRA type model for, for the, for the responsible crypto players in the industry, I think is now a potential uh, path forward. Understood. Thank you. Uh, 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 Steve, uh, you have recently moved uh, moved uh, your headquarters, uh, if there is such a physical thing these days, from Switzerland to, uh, as I understand, Washington D.C. So, does uh, the compliance uh, uh, do did the compliance related consideration kind of factor into your decision to move the jurisdiction? Um, what uh, what uh, can you you know tell a little bit about it about that? Uh, I wouldn't say it was driven by compliance <clears throat> so much as it was, uh, it, look, the Swiss were great. And uh, we went through a, a rigorous uh, sort of application process with them. It became clear that when we wanted to focus our initial phase on a U.S. stable coin, um, that it made sense for us to be within the U.S. regulatory perimeter. Uh, as you can understand, U.S. regulators um have an interest in U.S. dollar stable coins, and it, right. it was just going to be more effective and efficient for us. I think on the AML issues, um, I mean, we were <clears throat> we were in a good place uh, regardless. Um, you know, I, I do think on the more general point, I would just comment that um, I think what what will drive uh, the direction of regulation and compliance are the use cases, and I I, I really think the next stage needs to be the development of, of use cases that go beyond uh, speculation or, you know, the, the, the kind of, uh, trading applications that we've got now. And those are, those are fine as far as they go, but they, they drive a certain perception of the industry, which I think is unfair. It, it is a much broader, uh, potential. And, and once we realize that, uh, I think the regulatory landscape will, will adapt so that you will actually have regulation tailored to particular uses as opposed to this sort of, uh, almost random taxonomy and, you know, sometimes one size fits all approach right now, which I, I don't think is helpful for anyone. Understood. Understood. And, and, and Tom, uh, uh, turning to, turning to elliptic, um, you know, what kind of a big shift you are envisioning in the ways that people, you know, will be using your tools and how do you sort of stay on top of the trends that you see, you know, the ransomware has, has become a very, you know, big problem, People talk about uh, the possibility of moving funds and jump from chain to chain. So we're talking about cross-chain monitoring, tracking that you need to be aware of these days, right? So all these new vectors of attack, how do, you know, kind of inform you as to uh, how you build a business for the clients going forward? Yeah, so like some of the, the other speakers, I'm going to touch on uh, the distinction to be made between different coins. So I, I think that with... With the combination of existing regulation, compliance techniques, blockchain analytics, we have pretty strong foundations for, from which to address financial crime risks in crypto. But where I think this starts to break down is where blockchain analytics becomes ineffective. And, of course, one type of asset where that is the case is privacy coins. Um, the likes of Monero, where there isn't a transparent blockchain that you can perform analytics on or, or trace assets through. And we are starting to see criminals shift more towards these assets, um, especially in areas such as ransomware and darknet markets. Um, at the moment, that the use of privacy coins by criminals is limited by relatively low levels of liquidity and acceptance for those assets. Um, but I think we probably need to ask ourselves as a, as a society whether we want to allow these completely anonymous coins to grow in liquidity and acceptance because they will pose a significant financial crime risk, which blockchain analytics or technology alone um, can't solve. Okay, understood. Uh, well, uh, you know, that concludes kind of my, my, my round of questions. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to... Uh, uh, hear your opinions. Uh, I'm really thrilled to have you on board. Um, so I also wanted to so thank you so much, uh, Ian, Steve, Tom, Antonio, Dan. Uh, I also wanted to uh, thank the Horaces uh, for putting this uh, global event uh, and global meeting together. And thank you so much also to the around the world folks who made this technologically possible for us. Uh, again, those who uh, you know kindly turned tuned in and listened to us live. 
uh, you know, please make sure that you stay in touch with us through the chat, you know, capabilities so that if you have any further questions or you wanted to follow up with us, uh, please do so. So any, any uh, you know, concluding remarks from you guys? Appreciate you having me. From my, from my oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Boris, for putting this together. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks. You too. Take, Take care. care. You too. Take care. Thanks. Take care.